uh, thanks to this time of year, my uh, every year coaching coaching basketball, you get around all the, the high school students with their with all their colds, and you get to experience a little bit of all of them, all rolled into one. So, uh, if you like my voice, uh, an octave lower, um, you can thank the basketball team. Um, they are accepting donations. <laughs> I want to invite you guys to turn in your Bibles to guess where Philippians chapter four. Philippians chapter 4. And, and this is where we have been. This is where we're going to continue to be. And uh, just the goodness of God in this passage uh, today. Uh, we're we're going to continue to look at this. And we're going to jump right in. Uh, recapping re really where we've been. We've been seeing that, that really uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, 4 through 9 really lays out like a step-by-step -step guide into how we find peace. It's like this is, this is part 1. <laughs> Uh, this is part two, this is part three, part four. And so as we've seen each of those, um, we get closer and closer to understanding how we walk in God's peace. And, and friends, I don't know how to tell you this. I know I say it enough, hopefully, but I, this is something that will change your life um, in tremendous ways if you walk with the Lord in these steps. I don't believe he says these things accidentally. I think they're laid out the way they are to get through to us. I think God, uh, when, when these were written, was thinking, man, in 2019, there's going to be a group of people that really, really need to understand this. So let me make it clear as day for them how we get from point A to point, well, point Z, I guess. Um, so we're going to jump right into Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. It's in your sermon notes, and would you read it with me? And, uh, and let's, just, let's just rejoice in what God has said. So let's go. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. I like that. The God of peace. He's not a God of war. He is a God of peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And so we see this in Scripture. And now we see this passage laid out for us. And it gives us key steps. Step one, rejoice. How often? All the time, every every moment of every day. It's not saying rejoice once a day. It is saying rejoice in the Lord always. So we have unending, we have unbreakable, we have unshakable, gloriously good news in Jesus Christ. Do you understand that we have unending, unbreakable, unshakable, gloriously good news in Jesus Christ? And there is no powerful news of sorrow that could ever compare with the power of the good news that is in Jesus. When we understand that, when we intentionally think about what God has done for us, that is what it means to rejoice. It doesn't mean that we walk around or we skip around all the time pretending everything's great when it's hard. No, it means that we are rejoicing this internal understanding that I choose to think about what God has done for me. To rejoice in the greatness of his majesty. And even when sorrow comes, I will rejoice in the Lord who is good. Step two, let your gentleness be evident to some. <laughs> no, to, to all. To all. <coughs> Excuse me. To all, let your gentleness be evident to all. And friends, this is simply put, we don't get to carry hostages into the place of peace. You know, we don't get to carry hostages in our anger, in our bitterness, in our lack of forgiveness. We do not get to carry them into the path, the place of peace. We must first respond to others the way God has responded to us. If you want to experience the peace that surpasses all understanding, you must treat others the way God has treated you. I mean, first you have to accept what God's done for you. That's the rejoicing part. Step two is you have to release other people of the things you're holding against them. You have to forgive. You have to let go. And instead of using your power to manipulate or to whatever, you are to use your power to build up, to encourage, to save, just as Jesus did for us. He didn't use his power to condemn us. 
says that in John 3, 16 and 17. He says in verse 17, I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save us. And so let your gentleness be evident to all. How do we do that? Well, well, we need God's power and his strength to guide us. The more we focus on how he treats us, the easier it is to release others. Part three, and we looked at this last week. Would you say it with me? The Lord is near. It's a statement. It's not a command. All the others are commands. This is the one that's just a statement. The statement is this. The Lord is near. To truly know peace, we must embrace the nearness, the closeness, the intimate proximity at our right hand, as it says in Psalms. Or we're like a shepherd, or as Jesus says, like a branch and a vine. The deep connection that Jesus offers us at all times, all the time, the Lord is near. There is never a time in your life that the Lord is not near. We too must embrace the fact that he is coming back at any moment, at any moment. Instead of the big snowstorm today, it could be the Jesus storm. We could, we could get Jesus coming today instead of a snowstorm. And he will come back at any moment, and he is going to return eventually to make all things new. Again, news to rejoice. And so there's this part of the Lord is near. It's an invitation, friends, to stop. To stop doing. And just to be present. To be still, as scripture says, and to know that he is God. Now, now we get to part four. And, and so to explain part four, um, you know, we have these steps. Rejoice, gentleness, evident to all. Part four, to truly know peace. We understand that we must embrace the nearness this is still part three, the close proximity of Jesus to us at all times. We must embrace his imminent return, and we must accept the invitation to be still and to know that he is God. Right. So now we get to part four, and it is December 1st, which means in 24 days, it is my birthday. My birthday. I'm supposed to say Chris's birthday. <laughs> And, and I'm, I don't know how long I'm going to be, but I know there's a three in the number and there's a four in the number this year. On December 25th, I will, I will turn 43. Um, but it is Christmas coming in 24 days. And, and my, my parents, uh, I, I love Christmas. I, I still love Christmas. But growing up, Christmas was amazing. But this, this is not what our tree looked like. Right? Maybe half that many presents. No, we just had, my parents were so generous in giving gifts to us during Christmas. We just, we had so many. And it was this great, great moment of sitting there in front of the presents when we would get together for that point. And it was always this question of like, okay, where do I begin? And you kind of ask it out loud because, because part one, you want to know where the socks and underwear packages are so you can open them first because you don't want to get to the very end of all the presents and then you open socks. I mean, that, that's really anticlimactic, right? I mean, it's useful, but anticlimactic. And so, so it's this point of where do we begin? Which do I open first? How do I get the socks and underwear out of the way? Well, today, to be where we're at in this passage, and I, I say this a little bit jokingly, but I do mean it, to be where we're at in this passage, the step we're about to look at, for me as a pastor, for me as a follower of Jesus, this, this verse, verse six, is it, step four is like Christmas. To, to me. It's like Christmas as a pastor. As, as your pastor, and being here all these years, this is one thing I look at. I'm like, so, so excited to open this in, in front of you guys and show you. And, and trust me, it's not socks. You know, it's, it's really good stuff. It's, it's so powerful. And a part of it is where do we begin? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take our time, and we're not just going to rush and try to just say, wow, here it all is. We're going to look at the first part of verse 6. We're going to see that. And this is how the first part of verse 6 goes. And it is the easiest thing on the world to do. You ready for it? Do. Say it with me. Not be anxious about anything. Look at those words for a moment. To not be anxious about anything. So what are we asked to be anxious about? There's no, there's no permission. There's no except for such and such. It says, do not be anxious about anything. First off, as we dive into this, let me issue this disclaimer. I even highlighted it for you. This is the disclaimer. This is the part that we need to understand what the Bible is saying and what the Bible isn't saying. Are you with me? The brain is a marvelous, fascinating, powerful, intricate, complicated work of art. That God has created. Would you agree to that? And, and each of you has one. You may not always use it, but each of us has one. 
Now, sometimes that incredibly complicated brain that God created to be so delicately and perfectly balanced, sometimes because of the brokenness of this broken world, sometimes the balance of that brain isn't quite in the right place. Sometimes the chemical balance isn't quite right. And, and so the brain suffers because of that. And like any other part of a body that suffers, it needs attention, right? If I came here and I had my, and my arm was broken, it was just flopping around, you would say, you need to get that looked at, right? It was common sense. The brain is so complicated. This passage addresses, friends, it addresses anxiety. And when we talk about anxiety, we are also at the same time addressing its cousin, depression. Now, the disclaimer is that the Bible is not saying mental illness or imbalance doesn't exist. It's not saying that at all. Hear me there very clearly. It's not saying those things can just be swept away, and it's not saying there's easy answers for those things. Just like there's medication and treatment that is useful for the human body, so also there's treatment and medication that can be useful for the balance of the human brain. Do you hear me when I'm saying? You hear what I'm trying not to say, right? So we need to understand that the passage addresses anxiety and these things, but it is not dismissing depression or anxiety that uh, come from imbalance. It is addressing regular anxiety and regular depression, but it's not addressing the imbalance part. Trust me, I've used this passage extensively in my own life. It has transformed my life, but I've also used it extensively in counseling, and I see that there's an undeniable power in there, but there also has to be a clear understanding. Hey, this isn't one of those things that, that's just saying, oh, you just need to say this, and then everything is fixed. Okay, we got that out of the way? We're good? Good. Me and that whoever said, uh-huh, is good. Everybody else is still frowning at me. Okay, let's look at it again. Do not be anxious about anything. This, as you might know, is a rattlesnake. Hannah uh, could tell you the story, Jessica could tell you the story. Um, as Hannah's growing up, Jessica shared a story repeatedly, repeatedly with Hannah in order for her to understand this. I know Hannah could tell us this verbatim, uh, but it was about this time that Jessica was walking with her family. They were out in nature. I don't remember if they're camping or what. I'm not the best at remembering all the details of stories. But, but as they were walking along, all of a sudden, Rich yelled at Jessica, and he said, stop right there. And so Jessica stopped. She froze right there. Then he went over and pointed out that she was about to step on or right next to a rattlesnake. Now, I assume that wouldn't have gone well for Jessica. She obeyed, soon realized that Rich had spotted a rattlesnake that she was about to step on. The point of Jessica's story that she told to Hannah, and the point that we tried to make with our kids as parents, is that they need to learn to trust and obey us as parents as we're trying to point them in the right direction. As we're trying to point them away from dangers and that the things we're trying to do, we're trying to have their best intentions in mind. And granted, we're not perfect, but overall, when we say things, please take it seriously and please listen as if you're about to step on a snake. Good advice, you can steal that and use it with your children. You can say there's this one time, Pastor Rich <laughs> told Jessica such and such. So when we look at this passage, we need to understand some things. Part one, the Bible. Do we believe that the Bible is the written word of God? Yes. yes, okay, correct. Do we believe that we should take the Bible seriously, not as a joke? We mean that God really meant what he said. Yeah. Okay. Do we believe that, that God has our best intentions in mind? Always, okay. So if the Bible were to issue a command, then it implies then that the command is something we can obey and should obey, correct? It doesn't, it's not saying that we might not need help, but it is we are assuming that if the Bible issues us a command, that that implies that we can and should follow that command. We believe that to be true. We believe that when the Bible says, do not murder, he really wants it to where if I'm going to go over and visit Kurt Greenfield, that when I leave, he's still alive. Right? That's a good idea. It's a good idea. The commands of the Bible are meant to be taken seriously. It does not necessarily mean we can fulfill them without God's help, but we 
regardless, if we agree to these things, we need to understand that this passage is about a commandment. And the commandment is what? To not be anxious about anything. And so we are saying the Bible, the written word of God, taken seriously, written for our best intention, is something we can obey, is right, it's safe. And therefore, if it says that, then we can do it, to not be anxious about anything. Here's what Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 doesn't say. It does not say, do not be responsible. <laughs> the Bible never says not to be responsible. It never says to be clueless. It never says to be uh, not be responsible. Let me give you an illustration. Last week I mentioned that Ethan's swing broke when he was in the S-hook that holds up one of the chains, snapped in half while he was in mid-swing. This is what our fence looks like now. It hasn't always looked like that. It used to be a nice panel. Now it has a massive dent. If you go on the other side, you'll see that it sticks out about that much. And it's kind of the shape and size of Ethan's torso and derriere. Ethan, when that swing snapped, he flew into our fence. And trust me, that was a moment of, of panic and what in the world just happened and mystery. And we still don't fully know how it happened. Or what, I mean, we know that the hook broke and he went into the fence. We don't know what it looked like. Nobody was watching and he hasn't told us yet exactly. But this is what it looks like. Now you can imagine that then when Ethan got on the swing next to that one and swing that, that day, that, that next moment, that's Ethan. He didn't, you know, he, he kind of you know, needed to brush himself off and get a little bit of care and love, but he was ready to get back on and get back on the horse and swing once again. Now you can imagine that he is doing that, and I've seen this S hook that is, that is snapped in half, and he's on this other swing, and he's going full throttle once again, that I'm thinking, you know, there's a possibility that that other one could break too, right? That's a logical thought. If you look to the right of where that, um, where that hit, you would see that there is a pole there, and the poles are reinforced. The other swing is aimed directly at that. So if that swing was to break, and he's on at full throttle, the swing, the fence isn't going to give as much as it did in the middle of the panel. So I see that. The passage we're looking at doesn't say don't be responsible, but I'll tell you the truth, and it's odd that this came a week, a week before I have to preach on this passage. I had anxiety when Ethan was swinging after this incident. Horrible, right? I was worried about that happening again. So what did we do? Well, my dad came over and helped out, and, and they helped purchase the parts, and now we reinforced the, the original swing uh, as to where, you know, the Incredible Hulk could swing on it and it would not snap or break. You know, you have to be careful when you say that. It's like saying the Titanic would never sink. But, but it's reinforced, and it was a responsible, wise thing to do was to take care of it. Sometimes things happen in our lives, and they are things that we have anxiety, but that is a call not to uh, ignore. It's a call to do something about it. Does that make sense? I'm trying to say that the Bible isn't saying is don't worry about anything and don't be responsible for anything because it'll all work out. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says don't be anxious about anything. So part one, it doesn't say don't be responsible. Part two, it doesn't say uh, be careless. This passage doesn't say be careless. If you have children, if you have anything that you have in your life, you should be careful with the possessions you have, the money you've been given, uh, required, called to take care of, the responsibilities you have. God expects you to be careful with all those things. The passage doesn't say be careless. So what it does say is do not be anxious about anything, anything, anything. What does it mean to be anxious? Ang anxiety is about worry, right? And worry brings tension. It knots us up. It causes us to, to kind of turn inward and to worry and be consumed with something. The top four worries, it's a common thing to worry. The top four worries are this. Number one, work and school. And school is, is one of them. I want you to rank these in your own lives. Which, which of these is the number one, two, three, four? Relationships is the second. There's another worry that is in the top four. People worry about relationships, about how they're going to be, if things are going to be okay. People worry about money, whether they're going to have enough, whether they're going to pay the bills, whether they're going to lose it. And they worry about health, health of themselves or health of others. 
These are the top four breweries. Which of them, if you rank them, you know, just take a moment. Which was your number one? What do you worry about the most? Hannah and I were talking about it, and she said if it was if it was today, if I was talking about today, then school is a big concern and something that I worry about, doing well in school. What are you worried about? And if you had to rank them, where, where do you, where does your worry lie? What are you tense and anxious about? The Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. What does that mean? What does it mean to worry? What is it? I preached this sermon on the Sermon on the Mount once where Jesus says not to worry about your life because each day has enough trouble of its own. You know that passage in Matthew chapter 6. And one woman's response to, to the sermon afterwards was, was brilliant. Her, her response was this. She says, well, I have to worry about stuff because if I don't, who will? I have to worry about stuff because if I don't, who will? <laughs> no, the Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. It wasn't anything, don't worry. No, no, be anxious about anything. So what is worry? Worry is something that is based on fear. I think we know this. Worry is about fear. We don't worry about things we're not afraid of. Are, are any of you really worried that tomorrow's going to be a great day? Are any of you worried that, that tomorrow you're going to win a million dollars? Anybody like, is that keeping you up at night? And it's like, yeah, that's true. But that doesn't happen. No, it's worried about things that we're afraid of. And what is it? It's, it's based on fear, and it's fear of what may or may not happen at some moment. Worry is about fear of what may or may not happen at some moment. It's not based on certainty. It's based on fear of what might happen. The Bible says you don't get to do that. It doesn't suggest it. It says you don't get the option. You cannot be afraid of what may or may not happen tomorrow. But doesn't the Bible show fear? Doesn't the Bible tell us about this? A fear of what may or may not happen. It's not the same thing as knowing something for sure will happen. If somebody, if somebody came in here with a gun and lined us all up in a line and, and executed person by person by person, it would be natural to be afraid of what was going to happen. That was a certainty that was going to happen. That's not what the Bible is saying. It's saying you are speculating on tomorrow. Jesus was troubled in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember the story? Before he's turned over by Judas Iscariot, he's in the garden of Gethsemane with the disciples, and he's asking them to pray, and he's angry, he's frustrated because they can't stay awake and pray, because he's so troubled in his spirit, because he knows that in just a few moments he's going to be turned over. He knows in just a few moments he's going to be put on trial after trial. He knows that within 24 hours he's going to be crucified, and he's going to hang there suffering and abandon completely alone, and so he is troubled in his spirit. That's not anxiety. That is a reality. The trembling of the reality that was coming. God's command to you and I is to not be anxious about anything. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane wasn't anxious. He was troubled because he knew what he had to do and he knew how hard it was going to be. But for us, do not be anxious about anything. So what does fear do? What does what worrying about tomorrow do? Anybody list the positive attributes of worry? Are there any? Well, we know one, it takes mental energy and focus to concentrate on maybe. Think about that. When you worry, you're using your mental energy and focus, the strength that you have in the human mind, to concentrate on a maybe. It is, it is something that affects us emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically. The more you worry, the more you drain all of those tanks, and the more you suffer because of it, the less productive and useful you are. You understand that? Worry does not have any good benefit to it. And, and so what really is worry? Worry is gambling against goodness. When we worry, we're saying tomorrow or whatever could possibly happen is probably going to happen. It's probably going to be bad. When we worry, we are gambling against goodness. We are betting that badness is going to win. No wonder God says, do not worry, do not be anxious about anything. About anything. It robs you 
of your joy. It robs you of your hope. It combats your faith. You cannot have the joy of the Lord and be fearing what may happen or may not happen tomorrow. You cannot have hope in what God is going to do when you are worried about what might happen wrong. And having faith is all about being sure of the goodness of God. We know these things to be true. John chapter 1, verse 3 through 4 tells us that through him, through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In Jesus, in him, was what? Life. And that life was the light of all people. So in other words, using worrying is like using the light, the spark of life that God gives us. And we're using it up on uncertainties. No wonder God says don't do it. No wonder God commands do not be anxious about anything. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25 says this. Anxiety weighs down the heart. A kind word cheers it up. Anxiety weighs down the heart. A simple question. But do you believe that God wants you to be weighed down by worry and anxiety? Do you believe that he wants you to be less affected, to be drained physically, mentally, spiritually, all of those things? Do you believe he wants you to be weighed down by what might or might not happen? No. No. Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus says, would you just read it for me? Can any one of you, by worry, add a single hour to your life? What, what's the point of worry? Why do we do it? We are afraid and we're betting against the goodness of God and the goodness of life that is to come. So why do we worry? Why, what, what is it that drives worry? Why, why are we consumed? And why is it that probably for each of you sometime this week, you're going to find yourself anxious or worrying about something, right? You're going to find yourself at least tempted to worry. How? Why? What's the problem? Well, there's two core questions, I believe. Two core questions that plague each of us, and, and these core questions help us understand why we worry. Part one, and would you read it for me? Am I going to be okay? Am I going to be hit, or is it going to be okay? That is question number one. Am I going to be okay? You might say, is going to be okay, but ultimately, we are concerned with what is most valuable to us. Most likely, none of you is worried that tomorrow, somebody you've never met and have no connection with might die. I don't think any of you is consumed with anxiety, or that will keep you awake tonight, that somebody you don't know, or have never met, or had any interaction with might die, right? Right? You don't worry about those things, even though they're realities in our worlds, but we worry about things that matter to us. Am I going to be okay? It's like, this question is like the kid standing on the edge of the deep end for the first time, and his dad is there treading water. He says, jump. And that question that is going on in that child's mind, and that fear, am I going to be okay if I do this? And we ask that question all our lives. It's going to be okay. And the worry, when we worry, what we're saying is, I bet the answer is no. That I'm not going to be okay. I don't think it's going to work out. That's anxiety. That's worry. I bet it's not going to be okay. He's probably not going to catch me. He's probably not going to be able to speak. Probably going to be hard for me. I'm not going to make it. Second question, similar but different, just as powerful. Is do I matter? Do I matter? Does my life does my life matter? Uh, it's just wondering if what we do and our very existence is meaningful or valuable or longing deep within. The middle aged man who has worked the same job for 25 or 30 years and begins to see through it for the first time and realizes his life has been passing him by, he's asking that question. Does it even matter? Why even matter? The daughter who's given up for adoption is plagued by this question. Do I matter? 
We are plagued by these questions when we worry. We are often worried that the answer to the question is no. You don't matter. Do we understand, friends, why God doesn't want us to be anxious about anything? Worry is the opposite of trust. Anxiety is the opposite of worship. And together, living in them is the opposite of prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is talking to our fathers, connecting intimately with the one who knows you and loves you. Worry is the opposite of trust. Anxiety is the opposite of worship. Living in them is the opposite of prayer. You cannot do both at the same time. You cannot worry and worship at the same time. You cannot be anxious about tomorrow and trust in the Lord at the same time. You cannot live in them on a regular basis and have a life of prayer where you're genuinely connecting with a God who gives all good things. They're opposites. You can't choose both at the same time. So what do we do? How, how, do, we, how do we not be anxious? Am I, am I going to be okay? And here's how we know. This is what we do. There's more to come next week, and this is why we divided it to more than one Sunday. But let's look at this. Here's the way to start. How do I stop worrying today, Chris? How do I not be anxious about anything? Part one is we have to trust. We have to trust in God's answers to these questions. Am I going to be okay? What is God's answer to this question? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, Jesus said. My Father's house has plenty of room. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas, thankfully Thomas, had, had some anxiety, I think. And so he says this for us. He says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? What does Jesus answer? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Are you going to be okay? Jesus has answered that question once and for all. No matter what life brings, when you put your trust in God through Jesus Christ, you're going to be okay. He's preparing a place for you. And you are going to go to be with him in that place. He's going to come back for you no matter what trouble or sorrow or event may happen in your life. You are going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Question two, do I matter? What's God's answer to that question? It's such a big answer. It's, it's, I, we had to like narrow it down the selection, but here's, here's my favorite answer. Psalm 139, 13 through 18. For you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. Do you matter? No idea how much you matter. Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 through 20 says, Do you not know? Hey, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You were bought. Why? Because you matter so very, very much. You matter so very, very much. You're going to be okay. Anxiety and worry are based on not believing those to be true. The beginning, the beginning of victory in these is putting our trust in what God has said. I cannot receive the promise of God, the promised peace of God, if I am focused on my sorrows and my temporary conditions. I must rejoice in the abundant good news of Jesus Christ. I cannot receive the peace of God if I do not respond to others with the kindness and gentleness that the Lord responds to me with. I cannot find this peace if I do not realize the ultimate source of it is right here, right now, with me. 
peace is found in the Lord's nearness to me. And finally, I cannot dwell in peace. I'm walking in the badlands of worry and anxiety. The Bible lays a choice before us, friends. 25,000 choices a day. Are you going to choose to be anxious? Are you going to choose to worry? Are you going to choose to trust in the goodness of God? Let's turn our hearts to the Lord. This is how we do it. And it sounds so simple that it sounds foolish to say, but part one, do not be anxious. <laughs> the Bible says it so I can say it too, right? Rather, choose to dwell on God's good promises for you and worry or flee. Use your energy to pray instead of being afraid. And worry and anxiety have to leave in the presence of hope and faith and belief. Would you pray with me?